Hello. How are you doing? Back to here we are, um, part two of the next uh, sequence in our early civilizations from the Paleolithic into the Neolithic. So we kind of, I'm going to share screen. How do I do that? Share the screen. We already did, um, I think, you know, drew a couple of connect the dots between animals and then goddesses or female figure forms, or did we? We saw lots of animals in the caves and then we saw, I don't know, plenty of goddesses in caves, right? And so we've made a connection about celestial orbs and goddesses uh, imagery and function, right? But we, uh, now as we get into the Neolithic, what's really incredible and really crucial is this idea of um, agriculture and the emergence of mythology, the ripening of the soul through story. And so often that story has to do with um, uh, woman as goddess, as the center of the drama, as the center of the agricultural year, and it's a lot of words, so I'm going to get into the picture part in a second. But what you have now is in the Neolithic, and you can see by this slide, right? After about 10,000 BC, you have around 8,000 BC, you have uh, settlements. What's really cool about some of these settlements that are left over also in old Europe. Do you remember this old term, old Europe, right? All of this is old Europe. There's a really cool settlement right here called Katalhoyak, and it's in modern day Turkey. It's right here in the South. See, it's part of the Mediterranean. And that is this really cool, um, this is what's left of it, and this is what they think it looked like around 7,000 BC, which is 9,000 years ago. You know what's really cool about this place? As you can see, it's not built on any high, any high hills. It's built on low, in low valleys. Why is that? Why would they do that? Wouldn't that be worried that there were people that have to look out for enemy? Well, also, what else, what is there? Um, they were buried, all of the grave sites show they were buried without a bunch of um, accumulated wealth. People were pretty much buried um, alongside one another. And in this place, art, craft, trade flourished. And you know what's in the center of their temples? A birthing room and red ochre. And you're gonna see this come up again later too. You know what else is in this sacred center shrine? The oven, baking bread. So baking bread used to be kind of a sacred thing. I still kind of think it's a sacred thing. My grandmother taught me how to make all kinds of bread. I love baking bread, bread is cool. Oh, some of us have to worry about the whole gluten thing now, which I kind of do, but every once in a while, just can't help myself. It's the first thing I did when the pandemic hit, I just started baking and baking and baking and baking. <laughs> So essentially then, the other interesting thing about Karolhayuk is there is no fortifications. Look, there's no walls, and they're built in a valley, and there's no image of war. There's no image of torture. There's no image of sacrifice or human sacrifice. There's no image of rape. There's no image of violence at all. The closest thing you get to pictures of violence in Karolhayuk are vultures getting ready to eat the fallen, the dead. Now, you know, if you ever watch a vulture or one of those buzzards, they're not aggressive. They wait for the dead and then they go eat their meal. So it's an idea then that death was not the scary, violent, insane way we look at it like in our action films. Death was just one more part. Of, of existence because death wasn't the end. The goddess at this time was known as 
still as this holistic kind of goddess. And she was seen as this goddess of birth, death, and regeneration. Now, in more current times, you've seen the, called the triple goddess of maiden, mother, and crone. That's just another way to explain it, right? So this is where caves come back into place. Caves being kind of like the beginning where we saw a lot of artwork. Also could see it kind of as this safe place. Um, also like Mother Earth's womb, right? Also a place where you bury your dead. Where you bury your dead is also the same, not necessarily exactly the same, but the same soil where we grow our food. And so this idea of mother as womb and tomb is tens of thousands of years old, especially as we get into agriculture. So now, as you can see in the goddess of cattle, Hayek, look, she's got these flanked animals. And that is the thing you're going to see throughout the Neolithic is flanking, flanking, flanking. These are two lions. I know it's kind of hard to tell. And I apologize for um, some of the, um, you know, some of it is not, um, it's not easy to see. So you'll take my word for it. So essentially then, the interesting thing you might say, oh, here's something we haven't seen before, lions. But I could, you could give me almost any sample of any animal and I could trace it for you. I could trace it back to the Paleolithic. This is the end of the Paleolithic. In southern France, there's one of our caves again. And you actually have pictures of female lions with pictures of little vulvas. Yeah, you know, it just gets crazier and crazier. There's a picture of a lion in a cave. And then there is, next to it is all these tiny little, um, tiny little vulvas next to it. Again, what, what, is the, what does the lion mean here? Protective, strong, fierce right? These are in evidence of the ancient, our ancient humanity observing what nature could do. So now by the time you get to Kettle Hayek and you've got these lions flanking her, this is kind of, she's on a throne. She is enthroned while she's giving birth. And it's a very powerful act, powerful act of, of giving birth. This keeps going. We have an idea of lions, right? What does lion mean to you? Think about that for a second. Ever seen the Lion King, right? How about, you know, lion is the king of the jungle idea, which is kind of hierarchical and a little bit whitewashed because it's like, anyway, that's another story. The idea of the lion though, this goes way, 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 way back into our different Paleolithic past. What we're gonna start to see now in this discussion today is what Carl Jung, who got really into archetypes in the subconscious says that the psyche is two million years old and nothing in the psyche is ever lost. That means images of the moon and the lions and all animals and anything you can see in nature is unforgotten. Like we have a deep, deep, deep core psychic connection to all of the things in nature. So when you see them show up in movies and they ha and you have a reaction to them, it's because there's a symbolism that is ages, ages old. Or it keeps going. So by the time we get to Greece, and that will study of Greece will be another um, another lecture video, you have this goddess Kybel, who they say Kabul Hayek might have been called, but we'll leave park that right there because we really don't know her name. But by the time you get to Greece and then Rome, you have this mother goddess and she is flanked by lions. And here's another aspect of her too. Guess what? Then you have her in Roman times. She kind of looks like Queen Victoria. And it's, um, this is probably, this is a, um, a statue in Britain and it shows Kybel probably as Queen Victoria being drawn by these lions, right? It keeps going. Hello. Look at this. Well, this is an Egyptian goddess called Ketesh. And this also is about 3,000 years old. And she's standing on a lion. Right? Oh, it just keeps going. This is Sekhmet, the lion-headed goddess. So you see all through our uh, distant past, this is Diana. And she's being flanked by something. I actually think they're goats. But she was considered the hundred-breasted goddess. And... Um, I'm sorry, I don't have dates for her. She is uh, considered Roman, I think, at this point. So she's probably about 300 AD, 300 BC. 
The idea then also we're still here, the Nile River goddess, that would be an Egyptian goddess, 4000 BC, when is that? That's the Neolithic again, right? This is our bird goddess. What is so important about this goddess right here? Why would I show, be showing this to you? Well, we can start to unpack it a little bit. What do you think birds meant to the ancients after a long cold winter or after the migration where the birds have been gone? Suddenly in the spring, you see birds return. At, that's like a rebirth symbol, right? There's a theme for you, rebirth. You see uh, birds flying near the heavens. Birds can get closer to heaven than we can. So there, there's a lot of songs with this idea of the bird, uh, when I think of heaven, deliver me in a black winged bird, right? That's, so there's a, a lot of ideas about birds being this conduit to the heavens or to God. Hmm, kind of interesting how it's a goddess, right? And here you can see she's got sort of her wings and this little beak. And then you've also got this very pronounced buttocks. Here, the suggestion is, is that, have you ever seen a bird before it lays eggs? Its butt is kind of big and tufted. Um, and so it's this whole idea, yes, of fertility, but also being a, an emissary for earth and the heavens. There's a lot of arguments that we carry with us, the female winged woman, she who flies. We see that in a, a lot of different art through the ages, a lot of different imagery. So when we see um, fairies, so this is, I think, uh, Titania and Oberon from Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare. Um, that's the winged woman again. When we think of angels, okay, there's the Archangel Michael and uh, all of these other guys, and there are male angels, absolutely, yeah, no, no qualms there. But you also see it's kind of, usually those angels have long hair and flowing robes. It's an effeminate it's her interpretation. Could it be that maybe what Jung, Carl Jung was saying is that that idea of the bird goes that far back into our subconscious, into our psyches. And so we recognize this as something familiar. Could you even argue Mother Goose on her, on her goose? Um, is, is, is a female form, nurturing female form, upon a bird. So I'm going to pause there. That's the end of our Neolithic, but I want to just reiterate the fact that you could pick, choose almost any animal and you could do a little bit of research on, on where it is in history, where it emerges in folklore, where it emerges in our ancient, ancient past. And I would say that all roads lead back to uh, the Paleolithic for the most part. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. And um, when we pick back up, we'll get into the Bronze Age and then the Iron Age.